Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Abby, and I'll be explaining Rhyme in Lose Yourself. It's a song by Eminem, if you didn't know that. Um, and hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll see why I believe Eminem is an impressive lyricist. So a little background on Rhyme. On the macro level, two types of rhyme. Perfect rhyme and family rhyme. What they have in common is the two words will have the same vowel sounds. So here you have wish and fish and wish and witch. All of them have the I in common. But the difference here is in perfect rhyme, the consonant sound after the vowel is the same. So for perfect, we have wish, fish, the same sh. But in family, we have the sh and the ch. So those are the differences here. And in lose yourself, you'll commonly see the family rhyme. Next is rhyme scheme. Typically, you can either end a line, two lines will have the same, uh, the same rhyming word. So in this case, we have some lyrics here. Anyone know where they're from? Actually, so mm -hmm. yeah, I want it that way. You, you are my idea. fire, my one desire. Believe me when I say, I want it that way. Crap, no, it's not in my head. <laughs> <laughs> a more complex and sophisticated form of rhyme is internal rhyme, which is rhyming with in lines. So we'll see that here. Would anyone like to read this first stanza of Lose Yourself? Sure. Go his away. palms are sweaty, <laughs> knees weak, arms are heavy. There's vomit on his sweater already, mom's spaghetti. He's nervous. <laughs> the surface, he looks calm and ready to drop bombs, but he keeps on forgetting. Okay. <laughs> so, just within these four lines, there are three different repetitive vowel sounds. The ah and ah palms the E eh in sweaty, and then the E in knees. Take a second, see if you can spot those sounds within the rest of these lines. Palms, arms. Palms. Yeah, there's palms. Sweater. Sweater. Bomb. Bomb, yeah. On. Here. Already. Does this help? Yeah. So here we have palms, arms, bomb, moms, calm, drop, bombs. They all have the ah. Uh. Same with the sweaty. Sweaty, heavy sweater, already, spaghetti, ready, <laughs> forgetting. <laughs> and then you have knees, weak, and keeps it, the E. In addition, there's also nervous and surface, the er. <laughs> so let's try it with this second stanza. Anyone want to read it, or should I just do it? Do it. What he wrote down, the whole crowd goes so loud. He opens his mouth, but the words won't come out. He's choking now. Everybody's choking now. The clocks run out. Time's up. Over. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so in this situation, we have two repetitive sounds. We have the O oh in throat and the ow and down. And as you can see here, it just goes on and on. We wrote down, whole, goes, so, O, oh, won't, choke, joke. Over. Ooh, Same with down. We have down, crowd, loud, mouth, out, now, now, out, blow. Which isn't a real word, <laughs> but we're going to go with it. <laughs> but yeah, so this exists throughout the rest of yourself. Just take a listen after this. Well, not right after this, but after this later in the day. And you'll see it. It's everywhere. So again, with end rhyme, very easy to see, but very basic. Whereas internal rhyme, it's the next step. It's very sophisticated. Why be a king when you can be a god? Why be good when you can be great? And this is why I believe Eminem is an impressive lyricist. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So a thing that's just really impressed me about this class has been how much you guys really want to work out and do things. So the one thing when I was thinking about what I could present on was what I would be a so-called expert about. And um, while my rowing career was not unbelievable, I think that in working on the rowing machine is a huge thing. So today, I'm going to teach you about erging, the rowing machine. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> All right. So what, what does erg mean? Well, you know, there's, it's not really a specific word, but what it actually means is it's from the term ergometer, which um, is a term for a machine that measures the work performed. Um, but in, in a gym, it would probably be called a rowing machine or an indoor rower. And it looks like this. So we're, let's go over a little bit of the basics of what it is and what it's not. 
because I think that sometimes um, just if you saw the machine, you may think it, it worked a little bit differently um, than it actually does. So what Ergin is, it's actually a comprehensive leg workout, but it does utilize all types of the body. But the main thing to focus on there is that it is a leg workout, and it's a practice of the rowing stroke. So when you go outside, you'll have just a general idea of what you're supposed to um, be doing with each part of your body. Um, but what it's not, it's not an arms workout, and it's not any kind of oblique or back-focused workout either. Um, and it's not fun either, to be completely <laughs> honest. Um, however, there are, so there are two main parts of the stroke. Um, the first is the drive, the second is the recovery. So when you're up at, we would call it the catch, but when you're about to begin the stroke, um, you would, you, you're going to need to put the pressure onto the handle. So how you would do that is you would start with your legs, um, keeping your arms straight. You would then pull backwards with your back once your legs are down fully. And lastly, you would pull through with your arms. And this guy on the right will give a basic demonstration. Next is the recovery. And that's just the reverse. So you would move your arms back out to straight, primarily. Uh, you would then pivot your back forwards. And finally, you would bend your legs back up to the top where you got where you started. Do not recover with your legs first. The whole point is to keep a fluid motion, and if you recover with your legs first, which you see a lot of people doing, their legs will actually run into their hands, and that will kind of ruin the fluidity of it. So you'll see the arms go up first, and then the back and the legs. So that's you know, really the simple, simple of it. Um, it's mainly a leg workout. Just don't forget that because a lot of people will do it with their, you know, really, you could hurt your back doing it. Um, uh, remember, two parts, drive, legs, back, arms, recovery, arms, back, legs. Always keep refining your motion. Um, and it may not be fun, but it's an unbelievable workout. And it's something that I've done for the last eight years. And while I say I hate it, it's, it's been an amazing thing for fitness. And so if you wanna take a small break from your spin classes, uh, I think that this is an unbelievable um, workout. So thank you guys very much. I also had a video of me doing it. Hi everyone. As you all know, I'm from Colombia. And today I, went, I wanted to inform you and convince you with many different facts about my country and what it is today, the third largest economy in Latin America after Brazil and Mexico. As you all heard, um, Colombia has been through many difficult times in the past. Um, this is very recurring in the, in the media and there has been a lot of war for six decades uh, and a lot of drug trafficking. Many people take a benefit from that and because the land there, it's basically the best to grow coke and everything. So, but I'm not going to go over that today because I want you to live with a different view or perspective about my country. If you didn't know, Colombia is on the top of South America it is bordered by Venezuela, Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, and Panama. It has two oceans, the Atlantic and the, 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 Atlantic and the Pacific, and it has three mountain ranges. So that, that's why the weather varies a lot in different regions. Um, so we have desert in, on the north, La Guajira. It's very mountainous. That's where they grow the coffee. Here's the Amazon jungle that it borders Brazil. We have very blue oceans, and this is basically the only snow peak we have in Colombia. <laughs> uh, this is why Colombia has 10% of the planet's fauna and flora, despite the fact that its territory amounts to less than 1% of the Earth's surface. Um, it has the highest number of living species per square mile in, on, in the planet. It is the country with the highest number of flora species in the world. It has the highest number of orchids and palm trees in the world, and it has over 2,000 bird species. So you can find 
a lot of this. And so now I'm gonna go over the industries we focus on. We focus on a lot of uh, agricultural products and very primary products, such as uh, the flowers. It's the second largest exporter of cut flowers in the world, making around one billion per year, which covers 70% of the US market. In terms of emeralds, we have the 64% of the market share. Um, the, uh, in terms of coffee, it is considered the best coffee in the world. And it is the third largest producer after Brazil and Vietnam. Um, I'm missing here um, oil extraction and mining, which were the primary products I was talking about. And of course, the products um, each region identifies itself with a different kind of variety. Um, so, where do where do all people live? Um, there are three major cities in Colombia: Bogota, which is the capital; it's in the very centralized. Um, Medellin. It was considered in the 2012 by the Wall Street Journal, Journal the most innovative city of the year. It has. Most of the flowers come from there. Um, and Cali, which deserves its own slideshow because I'm from there. <laughs> it, it's the world capital of salsa. Basic, basically, if you don't learn how to dance salsa, uh, you cannot grow girls. <laughs> <laughs> so it's more towards, uh, to the, towards the Pacific area. <laughs> Uh, this is very a uh, typical dish from there. It's basically a soup made of potatoes and meat, and it, I know it looks disgusting, but that's what we eat. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm gonna tell you why to visit Colombia. It's a country in the midst of development with a stable economy, a privileged geographic location, abundant natural resources, and above all, like her. Farm <laughs> kind of passionate people. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Holly, and I'm here to talk to you today about my family. <laughs> um, this is my dad, obviously, my mom, and yours truly. Um, I want you all to take a look at this picture and see if you notice anything different about us. And if you already know where I'm getting at, just. Anything? Other than the birthday hat? Oh yeah, it's my dad's 50th birthday. <laughs> how cute, right? Uh, how about this one? Me and my dad. Anything different? No? No. Okay. How about just my parents? Well, okay. So I'm taking from the crickets chirping that you guys are still a little confused. Um, you can't tell, but my parents are both deaf. Um, and I know that deaf people aren't something you encounter every single day, so I'm here to answer all of the questions that are probably running through your mind right now. So first of all, um, it's not genetic, I can hear pretty well. <laughs> um, but my mom was actually born deaf because of an illness that my grandma had when she was giving birth to my mom. And my dad became deaf when he was seven years old because of an ear infection. That part's a little bit genetic, I've always had tubes in my ears, still have tubes in my ears, and I just got them last week. And I got to pick the colors this time around, which is the first time that's ever happened. So I have hot pink in this ear and lime green in this ear, which I think is so cool. <laughs> um, and then second, um, I do know some sign language. Um, it was my first language. Uh, so that was cool, right? Um, and they, they taught me it before I learned English. And I learned English by you know, interacting with family. My dad was one of 13, so we always had family around. Um, and I watched a lot of Rugrats, too, which helped me learn some English there, too. Um, third, they can drive. A lot of people ask that question, um, but just because of police sirens and everything that's going on when you're driving, you don't realize how much you rely on your hearing, but I guarantee you they can notice a police car from more miles away than I ever could. My fourth is that our household is probably the loudest household you will ever experience in your entire life. They don't know how loud they're speaking, they don't know how loud the TV is, and somehow they magically always play with the volume. I don't know why. Do. Um, and then one time I actually came home from school after being away for three months and there was an alarm, an alarm clock going off upstairs and God only knows how long that alarm clock was <laughs> <laughs> And 
My fifth thing, they can do everything else just like we can. Um, just because they lost their sense of hearing doesn't mean that they don't have their other senses. So sneaking out was never an option for me because they always knew I was sneaking out before I even knew I was sneaking out. <laughs> so there's that. And since you don't encounter deaf people every day, um, a lot of things do happen that you wouldn't expect. So when I was growing up, we would all, my brother and I would always answer the telephone. And when a telemarketer calls, they say, hi, can I please speak to Jim or Cindy Morrow? Oh no, they're both deaf. Oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Oh. <laughs> Interesting, because they're deaf, they're not deaf. A, that's weird, because that doesn't make any sense in that context. And B, eh, you can't lose what you never had. And, or they would just say, oh, I'll call back later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you do that. Uh, there's also this one time where, you know, when you're in trouble, you call mom and dad, right? Wrong, not in my case. Uh, one time my brother, he and his friends in high school were speeding at 130 miles an hour down a highway here in St. Louis. Um, and you know, of course they got picked up by the police because you can't do that. And so they had to call my neighbor at three o'clock in the morning to come pick them all up. And just imagine, you know, your son, A, not being home in the morning and B, finding him across the street because your neighbor had to pick him up from jail. <laughs> that wasn't a good day in the Mara household. Um, so, just in essence, here you can't judge a book by its cover. They look totally normal, but they aren't. They're normal in their own sense, but to us it's not normal. So my lesson for you all is don't just assume what you see is all there. Take a look at it because you never know what you'll find. Amen. <laughs>
well, we sell more beer, but lines also run less efficiently during the summertime because of the heat, right? So we got to go through, we got to look at those and we analyze and we see uh, what different speeds each package is going. We can break it down to the stock code even. So, I mean, it's, it's very in-depth and we go through and we make those adjustments here. And so at the end of the day, because it comes down to one of our major targets at the brewery and that's FPA and PPA. So FPA is your frozen planned uh, production attainment. So um, or frozen period attainment. So what we do is we take a snapshot 24 hours out, right? So 24 hours out, we take a snapshot of what the production plan is. Okay, we want to hit within 82% of that. We want to be 82% um, is the St. Louis Brewery's target. We want to be 82% accurate that what we have scheduled out there for that 24 hours we hit. So by looking at line speeds, that directly affects you know that target. This. That is mind blowing to me. Like that's two different spreadsheets. Okay, so this is what you guys in sales are driving, right? So every new package or marketing, I guess we'll we'll point the finger there. But every new package that comes out, right? There's so many materials that go behind that, right? So here it's just showing all the cartons, right? So every NFL team has a specific carton, right? We have specific crowns, specific labels, all this that has to go into it. So this is something we monitor because at the end of the day, we don't want obsolete materials, right? So if we over order something, we're throwing away money. Last thing that's important, I know you guys have heard VPO a couple times and asked kind of questions on that. So it's standardizing the breweries, right? And making sure that we're operating. This right here is a good example of it. Every day we do a phone call with the BSC to make sure that shipment schedules are on track and things like that. But we have the VPO that plays a role and that's, this is a tour. So this is just like your meeting schedule and itinerary. So this wasn't the, okay, maybe it was. So that's all I had um, on there. I know I'm running low on time as well. So anybody got any questions? Did I bore you enough, Elizabeth? <laughs> all right.